Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Calgary Flames are on the outside looking in on the playoff picture still. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt here to talk about Matt. I I guess one of the doldrums of the season weeks, I guess, is a week where the Flames just played some hockey and there wasn't a whole lot of story outside of it. Well, the only uh, upside was the stellar play of uh, Dustin Wolf. Uh, Outside of that, it was a rather uneventful week in the Flames world. Let's go back and recap what did happen. The Flames had the Colorado Avalanche come to town on March 12th, and uh, not a whole lot to talk about there. Flames lose 6-2. Dan Vladar started here. Jacob Markstrom out hurt. Dan, uh, Dan Vladar gets pulled going into the third and we see Dustin Wolf here. I would say Dustin Wolf's play probably the only highlight. Yeah. Um, when your team plays so badly that the other team just stops trying in the third period, you know you're not having a good game. <laughs> yeah. And and it, it yeah it looked like the Harlem Globetrotters versus you know. <laughs> a, B League, no namer. Well, what's the uh, NBA minor league called? The G League or something? I don't know. I don't watch yeah. uh, basketball. No, but yeah, it's like an A ball baseball team. Like not even AHL, but like a couple tiers below that level. Yeah, it was not a good performance by the Flames at all. I can't blame Vladar for anything. It's one of those where you need the eighteen guys that are out in front of you to actually do something anything to help you and uh he didn't really get any of that sure didn't and even coach huska if you listen to his post-game media conference called out the veterans here said that the older players looked flat and i think that's uh, a nice way of saying it yeah it was just 18 guys who weren't moving their legs weren't moving their sticks weren't really doing anything here yeah and it's hard to have a cohesive finish to the season uh, when your players are just coming out and giving out performances like that. like You need your team to have things to build forward with into the following season and things to look forward to. And when you have performances like that from the veterans, it rubs off on the younger players as well, and it's hard for them to get cohesive and a good footing in the league as well. We saw Daniel Marimanov get a goal in this one. Uh, new Calgary Flame. We also saw Walker Dewar get a goal. And I don't know if you noticed this here, but Marimanov played really top four minutes. And you can tell, or at least I could, I think, that he wasn't a guy who was used to top four minutes. Like, he looked like he was run out of gas very quickly. Yeah, and then on top of it, he's just coming back off of a major knee yeah. surgery, too. And it usually takes... A while it probably won't be until november december next year for it to fully 100 percent feel normal and you know it, that's just part of how those type of operations handle and you know even with all of that i felt that he's been playing rather well overall he needs to be better but you know, there's enough there there that if he can stay healthy into next season and continue to build on the positive aspects of his game, he could be a top four defenseman for the yeah, team. Yeah, I mean, Mirmano played 1950, Pakal 1540, Joel Hanley 15 minutes, and uh, Ahochuk 823. So I think a lot of guys outside of Ahochuk who are probably getting more minutes than they're used to and are going to have to get used to, to playing that and adjusting to that. Yeah, and it's one of those where, you know, that was the whole purpose of the trade deadline was to bring in guys and give them a shot. And, you know, Mirmanov has played well um, enough. Uh, frankly, all of the new guys have played well in spurts uh, since we've acquired them. It's just uh, seeing if they can elevate their game to the next levels. Well, Thursday, the Vegas Golden Knights came to town and the Flames as a team elevated their game to the next level, looking much better than they did in that Colorado game, getting a big 4-1 to win 
Um, four four goals all in the third period here as the Flames beat the Golden Knights. And, it's, you know, the Golden Knights are not the powerhouse they once were. This is another team that's, you know, right with the Flames in kind of the wild card hunt. Um, what do you what did you think of this one? Well, Vegas has a number of guys that are hurt and not in the lineup. And that will be ready conveniently for the end of the season slash round not one. Not ready to play the last game of the season, but two days later for round one, all magically healthy. Yeah. Um, so it, it's one of those where um, the Flames basically beat the tar out of a team that for all intents and purposes was worse than they are overall, uh, just due to the, all the pieces missing from their lineup. And uh, I thought the Flames were better right off the hop and uh, Vegas was lucky to be heading into the third period with a one goal lead and the Flames just kept playing their game and ran over them. Yeah, I mean, this is, when I look at this, this is kind of what I expect the Calgary Flames to look like. Yeah, just compose. Like, you're not necessarily going to win each game, but, you know, you have to actually give an effort and reasonably look like you're trying out there and you know, um, to the Flames' credit, they outworked Vegas throughout the contest and got the and two that's points. Just for the contest for the whole season series, Calgary's won three of the four. So, you know, good for the Flames. It's it's always nice when you see, I think Vegas, we can all agree, is a you know, powerhouse team and nice when you can win the series against a powerhouse when you're not. Yes. Um, really want to give credit in this one again to Dryden Hunt. We've talked about Dryden Hunt in the past two assists in this game plus two i mean you know for a guy who's probably going to be your 13th forward going forward i think um you know looks really good there and also i thought probably the best showing we've seen from coronado in a while i agree and to me the player of the game was uh dustin wolf anytime um the knights got anything going he was there uh to make the saves look easy and there was a number of uh, plays where he, like he would make a spectacular save on one end and the puck would go up the ice and the Flames would either score or get a good scoring chance out of it. So uh, two of the four goals by the Flames in this were uh, situations like that. And it's nice to see, you know, flashes of the elite goaltender that he can be in this I think league. he's still got a ways to go. Oh, yes. But he's, but he's showing us that, you know, I don't think you put him in next year in, you know, 60 starts. But I think that, you know, he's showing us he has the tools. It's just a matter of how far he gets developing them. Yeah, like right now what he's showing is like I'm a solid 1B goaltender mm -hmm. and can be relied on for 35, 40 starts without any issue. And, you know... It, that could quickly flip to a 1A um, if he starts taking off, which, based on his play at every level, um, won't take long. <laughs> Very true. Um, I wasn't sure what to expect when I heard Dustin Wolf was in net for this one because, you know, after the they got blown out the game before, I thought, ah, this could they could light him up like San Jose did. I mean, he shouldn't have got let up against San Jose, but he did, and I think... This made him look like a, a bona fide NHL goaltender. Well, and that's the thing. Like you have to learn from situations. Like you're going to get blown out by teams. Uh, it doesn't matter what goaltender you are. Like the Flames have blown out Vasilevsky and, and Bobrovsky, who are two of the best goalies in the league, multiple times. And it's one of those things that you know you have to be able to learn from that and grow and. You know, getting sent back to the AHL after that and getting another number of starts before his next opportunity allowed him time to adapt and settle his game down more. And he came back up and, you know, looked amazing in both the Vegas and Montreal games. Yeah, and they decided to go back to him in the next game. Uh, Sunday night, the Montreal Canadien came to town and the Calgary Flames win 5-2 to two again with Wolf and Nett. Um notable here Michael Backlund our captain gets his 200th career goal and AJ Greer off the IR 
back in the lineup. And before we get into this, just wanted to point out where that puts uh, the captain all time. He's now number nine in terms of all time Calgary Flames scoring. Right behind, right below him is Hacken Lube at 193 goals, Johnny Goudreau 210 goals, Sean Monahan 212, Al McInnes 213, Lanny 215, Gary Roberts 257, Newendike 314, Flurry 364, and Jerome 525. So with Backlund having another season here, I think it's very feasible he could get another 15 goals in Ty Lanny. Oh yeah, five on uh, the list. I'm expecting him to pass Lanny next year. Yeah, it, it'd be kind of nice if he did. He'd get closer yep. to Jerome. Um, overall thoughts on the Montreal game. Um, Calgary basically uh, was able to weather the storm. Uh, Montreal brought everything in the first period. I th- I felt, and Wolf was there. Um, and made it look relatively easy, even though there was a number of saves that were challenging. Uh, he did get beat on one, uh, but it hit the post in the first period, and other than that, he looked stellar. Uh, the Flames got up to a 3 nothing lead, gave two back, and then scored two to make it 5-2. I think of all the games that Dustin Wolf played this week, which really he played in all three of three, um... I think this was the one where he looked the most comfortable. Yeah, it looked like a, it was just a Tuesday, so to speak, where, like, yeah, okay, I'm playing tonight. And yeah, like, he, he looked like he was definitely the better of the two goalies, and he looked like he belonged in the NHL here. Yeah, like, he, he basically shut Montreal down. Yep. Especially when it got to be 3-2. Like, uh, there was no more. And those are the things I look for in a young goaltender. Like, you know, you can be, you know, you can get a win because you had a good team in front of you. But there was a point in this game, like you said, where he just took charge. He just kind of took the game and closed it up. And just, you know, that's something we expect to see from veteran goaltenders. Yeah. And he's, you know, doing all the things that he needs to to show that he is an upper tier goaltender. And, you know, it also you know like uh, hearkening back to what we were saying last week that you know like needing to get time for Vladar and Wolf before the end of the season to see if we can let Markstrom go it's one of those things where you know with how Wolf has played in the two games you've already got the verdict on that uh, in my opinion that yeah he can definitely play in the NHL yeah now we just need to see what Vladar can do uh, the rest of the way to get the verdict on him. I totally agree. I think this was a, a good game. And again, Mirmanov scores here. Nice to see, you know, again, a guy who was a number seven in Vegas coming in and contributing. Yeah, and realistically, um, like it's always a good idea for teams that are in retools to get depth pieces from good teams. Because quite frequently they're overlooked well, because of Sharon the fact Govich that, was. yeah, like Sharon Govich was literally on their fourth line for most of the second half of last season, and he didn't even play in some of the playoff games because they just happened to be freakishly deep in the center position and didn't have it. You know, they had everybody else filled for the winger spot, so like there was just no room for him, and yet he comes here and you know is a thirty goal scorer and you know, looking like a, he might get closer to 40 by the end of the season. Yep, for sure. Well, with uh, those three games, the Flames now have 71 points in the season, 33 wins, 29 losses, five overtime losses for 71 total points. Seattle's behind them at 68, and the Flames are now fifth in the wild card race. St. Louis, 73, Minnesota, 74, Vegas, 79, and Nashville, 82. So Nashville and Vegas hold those wild card slots. Uh, Calgary, let's call it nine, po- eight points out of the wild card. But you know, Matt, that sounds like a a doable number. I still don't think this happens. No, like realistically, the Flames would have to go like thirteen and two the rest of the way, or something ridiculous, just to even be in the conversation. And even then, it's not likely. And yeah, like it, it, it just. Yeah, there's no realistic way that the Flames can close that much over that many teams. Like, 
it, it's tough and it's frustrating, but you know, like the flames are probably going to end up in the eight to twelve range in the in terms of draft pick, and you know, just in that middling zone. Overall. Yeah, and I mean the fact that these guys, you know, they look good and they've looked good the last couple, but knowing this team and what's happened, they're going to have a big blowout this week, and you know, then you're kind of back to square one, and that's that's not going to get you any close to the wild card. No, and like they they basically would need to win out for like the next couple of weeks just to even, you know, ha- you know, go on like the ten game winning streak kind of thing just to be alive still. You were mentioning <laughs> and like sorry, yeah, that was you it. were mentioning in the Montreal game. You know, the Dustin Wolf looks NHL ready, and I agree. And I think the question here is how the Calgary Flames use three goaltenders this year and what this means for the team. Jacob Markstrom currently injured. I don't know how much of him we'll see, um, but interesting to note, he's been injured so far two games in November with an upper body injury, one game in November with illness, seven games in December with a fractured finger, three games in January with a lower body injury, and two games so far in March with, uh, I think three now actually, with an ongoing lower body injury. All told, that's 15 of the Flames' 6-6 outings so far that he's been injured. I think one thing this tells me, Matt, is, you know, we've talked about is Jacob Marshall going to be a flame next year. He's getting older. And I think the fact he's been out for 15 of 6-6 games, I don't know, you know, how much you want to play him again this year to so that you can risk not getting him hurt and you can move him in the offseason. Yeah, like realistically... I think the most that you would see marks from is for half of the remaining games. Um, and he probably less than that. Uh, it, it's tough uh, because of the fact that, you know, you're having three guys who look like legitimate NHL goaltenders. There's only 15 games remaining. And, you know, like him getting more than seven starts, I don't really foresee that happening. Um, and and even like seven, a, why? Like, again, yeah. I think if you're looking at this as a... I don't know anyone that thinks Jacob Markstrom is going to be a Calgary Flame next year. I think it's a foregone conclusion. This guy's out of here in the offseason. We know that there's been some unhappiness there. I'm wondering if the team just shuts him down for the season. The, I think that uh, it's still a little early for that, but I, I would not be rushing him back, and I would be just saying... Here, take like an extra week off just to recoup from all your, you know, being banged up here, there, and everywhere. And then, uh, I mean, if he gets hurt seriously, that's really going to hurt the Flames going to the offseason trying to move him. It, exactly. Especially being and, like, over I 30, you know, you, teams are going to take a chance on him. They're not going to take a chance on him if he's hurt. Exactly. And that's why I would rather them like play like the next four or five games with Wolf and Vladar splitting them than rushing Markstrom back just for the sake of throwing him in there. Like, it's not going to make any real difference. Yeah, I mean, this week the Flames play, and it's a weird week. They have a Monday game, and then they have a Saturday and Sunday game. So a lot of time between them to rest whoever you want to rest. Um, I could even see, you know, Markstrom coming back and sitting on the bench for one of these because they want to send Wolf back to the American League to get some time. But I really, like... I don't know. I think you've got to give Dan Vladar some runway at this point and Dustin Wolf as well. Yeah. And realistically, there's no need. Um, like, how would you say? You need to figure out exactly what Vladar is for you next year. Because uh, if, if you're in a situation where Vladar and Wolf are basically 1Bs, you might go into the offseason on the, the mindset of maybe you flip Markstrom and Vladar uh, if you can, you know, because you're likely going to get a goaltender back with Markstrom regardless, um, because like the other team will need to shed a contract, uh, sort of like uh, what New Jersey did with moving maybe out they'll Manichek. wait till the off season. There might be somebody whose goalie is just going to walk anyways. Yeah, so like it's and one the Flames could always go like, get the, a you know a veteran guy, a, a Matt Murray or somebody as a free agent if they wanted to. Yeah, and it's one of those where uh, the team, I think, just needs to figure out what they're going to be doing with Fladar. Um, 
in my mind, it, it makes the most sense to have him as the starter for next year, just to, you know, even just in the one year, because if uh, he plays well and actually establishes himself as an NHL starter, that's awesome. And if he doesn't, well, you have Wolf there who can kind of take the reins a bit more in the second half, which will help Wolf as well. So it's not really a lose-lose situation there. Yeah. And then, I mean, one thing we're not talking about either, then the Flames are going to have to go find an American League goalie. Yeah, well, and that's where you have, uh, like, Sergeyev and uh, Chechilev. Yeah, I think they're going to want somebody with a little more experience, sort of like an Oscar Dansk type. Yeah, and, like, they're going to have to draft some more goaltenders and, you know, like, get the next Wolf in the system to start from 18 Yeah, and that on, takes a couple so years. Yeah. Yeah, because, like, Wolf's just starting to get, and it's, like, been five years. So it, it's one of those where, like, they, they need to get the next guy in the system, and I think that, you know, especially with the Flames having so many draft picks um, in the top three rounds, I wouldn't be shocked if they went for one of the better goaltenders in this And, I mean, draft. we've also seen them trade for young defensemen, trade for young for well, not really young forwards, but a lot of young defensemen. I guess Sharon Govich being your young forward... I could totally see the Flames doing the same in the offseason of making a trade, you know, to bring in somebody's American League backup who isn't getting a chance because he's behind somebody else. Yeah. Sort of like uh, what Connor Ingram was with uh, Nashville where he was behind uh, Askarov and uh, Saros, and yet he goes to Arizona and has played rather well all year. Flames have 15 games left at this point. How would you split up the starts? I think I would go seven five three, Marks from seven, Vladar five, and Wolf three. Yeah, I, I don't think Wolf stays in your roster from this point on. I think you want to get him no, back to the American I, League as soon as you can. Yeah, I would give like Wolf like the next start and like start him maybe for the next two and probably the final game of the season. And then uh after that it's just uh you know splitting things more or less evenly between Wolf and Markstrom. Yeah, I think I think and I think giving Wolf say. the Monday game, the tomorrow game against the Capitals makes sense. I think then you give uh Vladar probably Saturday against Vancouver and if Markstrom's healthy, give him Sunday against Buffalo. I think I'd probably then run Vladar for the two away games and Markstrom at home against LA. Um I think you want Markstrom and Ned against the Oilers, though maybe not because the Dars look good. Um, and, yeah. and then you've got some lousy teams here. Like you're seeing, you know, the Sharks twice. I think I would try to pull um, Wolf up for both of the Sharks games, especially after he didn't look good against the Sharks, at least one of them to sort of redeem himself. Yeah, that's where I was figuring like the last game in the season yeah i, as well. I think though that like the last game they always do fan appreciation day and stuff and i think if it's the last time we see markstrom the team's gonna want markstrom there to sort of you know raise the stick and say goodbye to the fans so i That's think from possible. an optics perspective you'll probably see markstrom there if he's yeah. healthy but yeah i think i i think instead of seven five three i think i'd probably go seven for the dar uh, maybe five for Markstrom and then get Wolf in for, you know, three or four of them. If that is, if Markstrom's still healthy and he, you know, he may be at the point where he says, why come back and play? Like, you know, like you said, take an extra week and maybe he just needs to sit out and maybe, you know, they want him to, maybe there's more to this than we're thinking it is. And the fact that he's had recurring injuries all year tells me he's probably been fighting something. Yeah. And if that's the case, the fact he's looking as good as he is while fighting something is awesome. Yeah, and it's one of those where, you know, the team just needs to be patient and sort every aspect what of it out. What a good problem to have, though. we got easy. three NHL-ready goaltenders. I would say, you know, Oscar Dansk, if you need him in a pinch as a backup, he's done NHL backup duties. Yeah, like, he, he's basically like a Joey McDonald type where if you needed him to, yeah, he could start at sort the NHL like level. Noodles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just not as well spoken as noodles. But yeah, I mean, you got, you know, three NHL ready goaltenders. What a good problem to have. Let's move, let's yep. move in from the defense. The Flames all, or sorry, in from the goal. The Flames don't really have a lot going on on defense in terms of 
roster spots that we're unsure of. I think for the rest of the season, you're going to see Shillington, Anderson, Uyghur, Mirmanov, Ahochuk, and Pakal as the top six. I would imagine um, Jordan Osterley doesn't play again unless somebody gets no. hurt. I, and same with Gilbert. Uh, probably you won't see him very much I'm either. kind of surprised, honestly, the Flames did not send uh, Osterley to the American League on waivers at the deadline. Just to give them a you know an extra guy, yeah. Um, but on the forward side, AJ Greer is back. He played in the Montreal game on the fourth line with Rooney and Coronado. Dryden Hunt is still in the roster at left wing. He's played with Sharon Govich Kuzmenko. This is going to become interesting for the Flames here because you've got Zari who needs to come back in the lineup sooner rather than later, I'd imagine, and because. AJ Greer came in, Jacob Peltier came out of the lineup. So Matt with I guess Hunt, Greer, Zari, Peltier, how do you manage those four guys? Well, frankly, I think that uh Peltier probably needs to go back to the AHL. Um he hasn't played poorly. Um it, it's just that uh he, he needs more time. Uh, it's much in the same way as like Coronado earlier in the year where just not quite ready for the NHL, but close. Yeah, and I think Peltier could just be getting back up speed after the shoulder injury too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, nothing to be worried about. Like, he's played okay. It's just he needs to be better than just okay. And he will be a player in this league. It's just, you know, getting himself to that next stage as well. Yeah, I think I would send Peltier down to the Wranglers, and I think I'd send Coronado down. If you've got Coronado playing on your fourth line, I'm not sure that's the most effective use of the player. I no, and how would you say for him it's good just to get another cup of coffee up here? Just yeah, which he did, and he e got each his time. Goal. Yeah, like each time it's a learning experience, and you know, the, especially as you're heading into both the playoffs and then next year for uh, the Flames. You know, like it, it's one of those where um, those guys need to have okay. I need to work on this, 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 and that in the off season to get better. And the only way to actually be able to figure out what those things are, you need to be thrown into the deep end and so you know get told to swim. And you know uh, those guys both are you know doing an adequate job, but need more from them both. Yeah, and you know I think that. Coronado's definitely, you're seeing that progress every time you bring him up. I think he's looked the most complete he has all season during this recall. But I don't want him sitting on the fourth line. Like, that's not the best place for him. So I think if you're going to keep a guy here, keep Dryden Hunt. I think Dryden Hunt can easily play third line, fourth line either way. When Zari comes yeah. back, you put him in. I would probably move Hunt to a line with Greer and Rooney and then put Zari, you know, wherever you want him. If you put him back with Pospel and Kadri or whatever you end up doing there. Um, but I think that's the lineup I'd be running with as far as the Flames at this point. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, and I think the Flames are looking for a long playoff run for the Wranglers, which is part of the reason I think they want to get Wolf down to the American League as, as early as they can as well, so that he can... Well, and the Wranglers are kind of not in a playoff spot right at the moment as yeah, well. Yeah, well, that's so it. You want to get Wolf back down so you can get them in that spot. I think sending Coronado, sending Peltier, you're going to send some reinforcements... Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, what you've gotten Dryden hunt and, you know, is he too good for the HL? I wouldn't say that, but there's no more development to be done for Dryden hunt at the American league level. No. And he's your quintessential 12th, 13th forward on a average. Team yeah. And as I think he's worse. 28 right now. So as a 28 year old, you know, I think he's right where he should be. And you put him on uh, you know, you know, you let him play for the rest of the year and then he becomes number 13 next year. Yep. Um, Walker Dewar out of the lineup. I think he probably sticks around as the 13th forward. I agree. Um, I don't know if he'll be here next year, but I think for this year, you know, Dewar is the other kind of interchangeable guy here. But I think once everyone else is healthy, Dewar probably doesn't get nearly as many starts. Yeah, and realistically, I don't think he'll be back next year. Um, one way he or has another. A, he still has one year on his deal. I think he'll just go down to the American League. Yeah, I was just meaning like on oh, the Flames roster. Yeah. I don't see him like whether he gets waived and traded or. I don't think anybody's going to give you sent. an asset for Walker Dewar. Yeah, the old future considerations. Yeah, 
you know, kind of thing, or, you know, insert name of contract You know what? Here I don't even know if anybody wants Walker Dewar. Like, I think everybody has a Walker Dewar-like player. I think you wave him, he clears, and you send him to the American League. Yep. And I think that's probably where he stays for most of his career. He's tried the NHL thing. He's looked okay. Nothing special. Um, AJ Greer not signed yet. Your thoughts. Do you think he signs? He, I would expect that the Flames will try, much like they did with Rooney, uh, to keep him beyond this year. Um, if he leaves, would that be disappointing? Yes. But is Greer replaceable? Yes. So it, it's a fine line. Um, 762, 500 is what he's making right now. How much did you pay him? Anywhere in the million dollars or less category. Like, he's a perfectly good fourth liner. He's done a great job as what he is. And, you know, if he wants to come back, great. I, if he doesn't, he's replaceable. I've always looked at kind of roster hierarchy. Like, how do you compare to other guys? And if you're giving Pospisil a million, I don't think you can give Greer more than that. Um, you know, his probably fourth line line mate... Um, Rooney's going to get 1.3. So I think you probably see if Greer comes back getting about a 900,000. Yeah, anywhere in that neighborhood. And, and I mean, he's 27. You know, he, this isn't going to be like an 80-year deal. I think it'll be, you know, one, two years. I couldn't see him doing more than three. Yeah. He's just like the insert miscellaneous fourth line guy who bounces around the league, like a Trevor Lewis yep. or... And I think yeah. when you're of that ilk, there's probably something to be said about having some stability. So if you can be here for, you know, two years, three years, whatever, at least you know where you're going to be. Yeah. So that's the kind of player that seems to always find a new home every summer. Which isn't a bad thing. It's just, uh, you know, like, would I like him back? Yes. Yeah. If, but, you know, it's also a two-way street. For sure. Yeah. And uh, I let's just say I don't think anybody's going to be, you know, overpaying for the services of AJ Greer. So I think if he doesn't come here, it's probably because he, you know, found another team that he would rather play for. I don't think he's going to make more, but for some reason, you know, a team he'd rather go to. Yeah. Like he might rather try to be a playoff team, you know, player on a playoff team, which would yeah, make he's sense. From Quebec, maybe, you know, the, the Canadian shoot him an offer or something like that. I could see that. Yeah happening well and he's been on generally fairly successful teams throughout his career so you know it would make sense that he would want to do that kind of thing but it, it's entirely a wait and see like his cap number is not going to you know be preventing the flames from doing anything with him so you know it it's flames are gonna have lot, pretty lots much of in, cap space. yeah yeah it's entirely in his court and that's all there is to it really yeah. um another player i want to talk about here on the roster before we talk about one guy not on the roster is jonathan huberto and i know still getting a bad rep from fans in a lot of cases to me and i want to see what you thought i think huberto has looked a lot better since the all-star break this is more of what i've seen of him when i watched him play with florida and um, I think that just has to do a lot with his line mates and the coaching staff working more with him to accommodate for Huberto's specific <coughs> skill set. Like, he's a very weird player in that he can make those ridiculous passes and make them look easy. And, um, you know, like you're, you're starting to see guys like Sharon Govich and Kuzmenko. Uh, be literally wide open for one timers and that you know on shots that shouldn't norm you know most players can't find the passing lane and yet he just makes it look easy and you know this is more of what we signed up for and to be frank I'm not really surprised that he's been looking better uh, as the season's gone on he's you know, like everything seeming to be more tailored to his style of play in terms of how the Flames are actually playing the game as well. Yeah, and I mean, you know, Jonathan Huberto's come in. I would say part of the issue with him since he's been a Flame is he really hasn't had steady line mates, right? I mean, he's they've tried him with everybody, and he's not a, 
a scorer. He's more of a playmaker. I mean, even if you look back at his days in Florida, his 115-point season, 85 assists, 30 goals. The season before that, 20 goals, 41 assists. 23 goals, 55 assists, the one before that. This is a guy who's good at moving the puck. And I think the Flames have been trying to get him to be the scorer. And I think that finally putting him, you know, we've seen him with Kadri, he's looking good. With Sharon Govich, he's looking good. I think he needs a guy he can move that puck to. And I think that's what we're finally seeing him, either the coaching staff or him or whatever, sort of realize and adapt to. Well, and you need opportunistic scorers with a guy like Huberto um, that can find those little openings to get open. Because no matter how tight the space is, Huberto can find those players through the thicket of other players' legs and sticks and all of that. So, you know, and when you have guys like uh, Sharon Govich and like Kuzmenko who are able to find and make space for themselves, Huberto's right there ready to put the puck right on their stick. And... You know, it's working really well. Him and Sharon Govich have really gotten along well. And frankly, Sharon Govich is the type of player specifically that Huberto excels yeah. with. And so, when we first, when when Kuzmenko first came to town, he was uh, on the right side of that line, and I thought he looked really good with Huberto. Yeah, and it's one of those where... Um, like moving forward, I think you'll need another shooter, whether that's Kuzmenko or, you know, insert miscellaneous guy here who can skate well, um, like Sharon Govich and can be an opportunistic scorer. Um, it, it just depends on who that is. And I don't know that the flames, I mean, we've seen Sharon Govich move to center pretty much since Lindholm left town. I don't know if that's where they want to keep him or not. I think next year you probably see Huberto on the left, Sharon Govich on the right, and I think you'll probably need them either to put Kadri there or go out and find another centerman. Yeah, and I think that the flexibility with Sharon Govich where you can just leave him as a center also helps because of the fact that, um, you know, you don't necessarily need to spend as much going and getting the right winger um, where a center is a lot more. It just depends on what's actually available in the market when the time yeah comes. and i mean the flames if they want to and i'm not saying they should but if they want to they're gonna have money to spend i don't think you go out and get the you know the top free agent because i don't know the top free agent wants to come here but i think that you could see the flames you know maybe bring in an aging centerman or something like that um and if they need to overpay for a year or two and it's not going to hurt things yeah and kind of like sell them on the fact that you know like if you want to come here play well and you know we could that you know if we're not successful we can flip you at the trade deadline to an elite team like there are some players that like that kind of flexibility um you know it all of that just depends on you know like with the flames having so many draft picks we could just acquire somebody at the draft as well um like, we've seen a bunch of players like uh, Kirby Doc mm -hmm. moving at the draft as well. So, you know, like, there's plenty of guys that are available each year. It just depends on the if you can find the right fit for the player. Yeah, and I, I don't see the Flames giving up assets for that guy. Maybe, but I don't see the Flames give up a lot of assets to bring that guy in. I think if it is, it'll end up being a free agent signing. Yeah, it just really depends. Like, if they, they think that... Uh, the player that they're acquiring makes more sense than the draft pick that they're giving up. I think they would pull that deal, but um, yeah, it just depends. Yeah, no, it would have to be at that point probably a, a relatively younger player then. Yeah, like uh, probably like under the age of twenty-four. Like say, like a team needs uh, the second uh, first-round pick that the Flames have. Yeah. You know, like they they might be like, oh well, hey, we'll give you this player that's like the already cooked version of you know the upside of the guy that we would be drafting at that point. Yeah, yeah, and I guy. mean, there's not a ton of really good centermen coming out on the free agent market this year. I'm just looking at them. Um, you know, I think that if you're if you're going to go out and get a guy, um, it'd be interesting if they went out and tried to get Monahan back. I don't know that you do, but that would be an interesting move. 
I could see potentially Tyson Yost or Chandler Stevenson being a, a tra target if you're trying to trade into that position. Um, if you like, if you were willing to, uh, you know, acquire sort of a guy and then sign him right away or get him on the free agent market, but there's not a ton of high end talent at the center position. No. And uh, that's where I was leaning more towards just leaving Sharon Govich the where yeah. he is. Unless you went out and got like Dawson Mercer, mm -hmm. uh, just to harken back to the marks from rumors. Jack uh, Roslevic would be an interesting month. pickup. He's 27 and he's uh, scheduled to be UFA. Yeah, like there are plenty of guys, whether it's younger than that or younger yeah. free agents. And yeah, we'll see. We'll see know, who comes yeah. available. It, it just where depends. They go. But you know, it's it's interesting to think about. Like you said, maybe trading that first and. I wouldn't put it past the Flames to do that. No, it, it just realistically depends on the situation when you get there. And the fact and that... And it's always hard to read uh, because, like, at the trade deadline, like, the day of, um, like, the prices that everybody was going for seemed to be a lot less than of what had been, like, even just two days yeah. prior. So And, you know, I mean, another yeah. way you could bring in that guy, too, if you just need, you know... There's a lot of teams that I think have expensive centermen they'd like to shed, and the Flames are going to have money to do that. Yeah. Well, and that's another wrinkle in the pie as well is that, hey, we would, like your, we would like your good young player, and we know you're in cap trouble. We can take your insert miscellaneous not very good player here if you give us that for this. Yeah, for sure. You know, like, say, like, just as a thought, like taking Andre Palat along with Mercer for first or whatever, that kind of situation. Yeah, that could that could definitely be something that that you could see there. And I think there's a couple teams, like you said, who have even if they're not a very good player, but a guy like Kuzmenko is maybe just not living up to the contract. Um, yeah, you know, I, where they just want to shed the the money to allocate, like say they're wanting to go for the free agent, like Stamco say. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, and I didn't even talk about Stamkos because there's no way he's coming to Calgary. No, but you know what I mean? Like it, another team might want to add him, like say Vegas. And like, how do we manipulate things so we can open up enough cap space to sign him too? Exactly. Yeah. You know, and so like the Flames can play there. Like that's how like uh, Max Pacioretty got traded to Carolina was that. Uh, they wanted to free up some space. So, like, you know, the Flames can definitely do that. Yep. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they do, but I think they, I think when it is all said and done, they need another centerman. Mm hmm. That, that seems to be priority number one. Yeah, and I don't think you've got the guys internally to promote into that position. No, and like looking at the draft as well, just the, the you know, cursory look because it's still not set in stone where the Flames are picking. Like, uh, after the first couple of picks, it's, like, all defensemen for, like, the rest of the top ten until you hit guys like a Gimla and a few others. So, but even then, I don't see the Flames taking a first-round pick and turn them pro right away. No, but, like, even then, you know, like, it, it's a little odd that uh, when the Flames are picking, it's basically defenseman central, give or take. Uh, so, like, it's you're not necessarily going to get a center with the Flames' first-round pick this year either, even if you're trying to address that internally. See what they end up doing there. One thing they yeah. did do is uh, sign Hunter Bristevich, the defenseman, I guess probably the star of the deal, if you will, coming over in the Lindholm deal from Vancouver, um, has been signed by the Flames to a three-year entry-level contract. Uh, 950,000 AAV per year for three years. Right now, he plays in the OHL, so still playing junior uh, hockey, and I think he's with Kitchener, and they're in a playoff spot, so you probably won't see him jumping over the Wranglers or anything for the playoffs until he's out, which hopefully for him is a while, but good to have him signed up. I mean, I wasn't worried that they weren't going to sign this kid, but nice to see it done so quickly. Yeah, like realistically, there was no, um, there was no question. Any rumors no, or you, you wouldn't anything. have traded for him if you didn't think you could get it done. Yeah, and like there was no rumors or anything that he wasn't going to sign with Vancouver either. So it, it 
it's not a, oh, well, he's American, therefore he's not going to sign here situation. If you talk to uh, our friend Kevin Olenek, who covers Vancouver, they had a pretty good idea that he might not have just because of Vancouver's defensive depth. Yeah, but even then, I think that he would have probably pulled an Adam Fox, like, sign me and then deal me later. Maybe. But, you know, they did anyway, so it's a moot point. The kid's got 89 points as a defenseman in the OHL for Kitchener. 12 goals, 77 assists, 89 points. That's that's quite a season. Yeah, well, and that that's where, like, having Huska as our coach helps. Uh, because, like, he has been a very good teacher for defensemen, and even though, um, like, he's the Flames head coach, like, he does consult with the Wranglers and, you know, helps out, so... Yeah. yeah, and with them all in the same building, not in Stockton anymore, you have more touch points with some of those young yeah, guys, too. Yeah, and especially, like, when you have guys like Poirier, like Moran, like Brustavich, who are all really dynamite offensive guys who struggled on the defensive side of things, getting them to just be passable defensively while being good, like such dynamos offensively, you know, like that's how you get your Rasmus Andersons, your Oliver Shillingtons, your Noah Hannafins. So, you know, the, the Flames need to hope that those guys are able to learn the instructions and you know, round out their defensive side of their game because they could be real dynamos for this team. Yeah, and I think, you know, like, Bristavich sort of like um, Wolf, you need to have some time. You need to give this kid some time to develop. We're all excited, but, you know, you need... They just need oh, yeah. some time Oh, yeah, and to... realistically, like, all of those guys probably won't see the NHL till they're 22 or 23 anyway. For sure. Yeah, I don't even think you give them uh, I mean, unless they're doing really well, I don't even think you're bringing them up for a cup of coffee at this point. Yeah, like maybe next, at the end of next year you might see Poirier and the year after mm -hmm. Moran and Bristavich, but yeah. I think Poirier starts in the AHL next yeah, year here. after having a year where he was pretty much hurt. I think you send him down yeah. there. Yeah, like unless he blows your socks off. And Matt, off. I need a correction. I said... I need a correction. I said earlier while we were talking about defenseman, Jordan Osterley has been assigned to the Wranglers. Yeah. So he's he's now not on the Flames roster. He's down with the Wranglers. So I was saying, why didn't they do it? I guess they did. But, yeah, I think, you know, Poirier down there. Um, Greshnikov is looking good. Bruce Navich is going to go down. Um, you've got, you know, you've got all these these young guys all of a sudden coming into the the – the flames back end, which is, you know, for years not been very good. And I think that if nothing else, we can say there's opportunity now. Yeah. And realistically, like the flames basically had the pro level figured out and like the early part of the, uh, drafting experience figured out, yeah. but none of the middle part. And so getting, uh, all the rest of the guys that they did, uh, whether it's a Hotiak or uh, Grushnikov or, you know, even Brusevich and Yermo, uh, like all of those guys kind of fill in that middle zone uh, for up and coming guys, which the Flames yeah, are lacking. Yeah, I mean, if you, look, if you look at the Wranglers blue line this year, it's currently Grushnikov, Poirier, Pullman, Soloviev, Osterley, Pissick, uh, Riddell, Lyle, Kuznetsov, Jardine, and Aspero. Like, half those guys aren't even Flames prospects. They're just there to because they needed bodies. Yeah, well, I think, like, the Flames themselves have played, like, 11 or 12 defensemen this year, so... Yeah, I mean, Will Riddell doesn't even have a picture on the Wranglers' website. Yeah. He's just, you know, defenseman number whatever, 16, that they needed a body for. Um. So, yeah, I think this is really going to help stabilize that, and I think... I think it'll be good to see Hunter in Calgary playing for the Wranglers next year. And sometimes it's tough when you've got a rebuilding team because it's always that question of, well, how many of the good guys are going to be down in the AHL? But I think even with the Flames rebuilding, you're not you're going to still see this team, I think, you know, Conroy's calling it a retool, not a rebuild. And I think you're still going to see guys like that maturing in the American League, which isn't always the case when, you know, you've got a small pool of talent they often get brought to the NHL very quickly, and I think you'll still see a lot of these guys ripening in the AHL. Yeah, and you're, you're going to, like over the next two or three years, see a lot of turnover for 
the middle six forwards and yeah. depth guys, and then like the bottom four defensemen. Like yes. all of those guys are gonna be switching out in and out depending on who does what. And but even the fact this year the Flames, you know, acquired everyone that's on their back end instead of promoting, I think says too that you know they're not sold on this. Okay, we got to bring up AHL guys. They will trade you know into the positions they need. Yeah, and you know it's one of those things having a lot of faith in your pro scouts and also being able to be intellectually honest about okay, well, these guys are only showing to this extent. We need them to be here. Mm -hmm. And, well, we need to bridge that gap. And, you know, the only way to do that is through trade. And, you know. Yeah, and, and it almost feels like Conroy's, you've seen the movie Moneyball. It almost feels like he's playing money puck right now. Well, and that's one of the things that I was saying earlier this year, that they need to take a page of the Tampa Bay Rays book where, you know, you have high-quality veteran guys flip them for prospects and just keep doing that. Uh, and, you know, you'll eventually get where you want to go and like that's literally what Tampa Bay does and like they're perennially one of the elitist teams in baseball both at the major league and minor league levels yeah because they don't care <laughs> you know like you have to have you have to have enough vets though. yeah well the NHL is different than baseball but you know like they, they literally don't care oh you're our star player okay well we'll go get four good prospects for you bye <laughs> I mean, you and I have talked a lot about it. I think part of the reason the Oilers weren't able to successfully rebuild, they didn't have enough veterans on that lineup. No, and that's where, like, the Flames having Backlund, Coleman, Kadri, and Huberdeau is instrumental, and Uyghur. Um, yeah. Like, real... And now the Oilers have vets, but they've had to overpay to bring them in. Yeah, and, like, realistically, just having them exist on this team while all the rest of the deck chairs get shuffled here, there, and everywhere is how this team's not going to be in the 10 12 year rebuild more like a you know three four year rebuild well matt the uh the flames have two games this week should we see if they can if some of those rebuilding stars can do their job and get the flames two wins hopefully they have a weird week they play monday at the dome against washington then they have tuesday wednesday thursday friday off they'll play uh, Saturday against the uh, Vancouver Canucks in Vancouver. So it's a 6.30 start time Monday, 8 p.m. Saturday. Then they have a back-to-back. -back. We'll talk about the back-to-back -back next week because we'll probably record before that game's over. Um, and a back-to-back -back with Buffalo. But two games, four days between them. Last week, we didn't do too well. I, I thought that we'd lose to Colorado and Vegas, win Montreal. You thought we'd lose all three. What are you going with this week? Um... I think that we'll win the Washington game and we'll lose the, the next one. So you think win Washington, lose to Vancouver? Yep. As much as I'm loath to lose to Vancouver, I just think that uh, they're trying to clinch the conference so that way they get the worst of the two uh, wildcard teams. And, you know, it's going to make a difference because... Uh, you know, you're going to be playing either L.A. or Vegas, likely, as uh, Wild Card 1, and Nashville is Wild Card 2 by the time you get there. So, you know, like, the, that's a big difference. So, By the same token, though, the Flames tend to get up for games when there's something riding on them, and I can see them kind of wanting to Rob shut that down for Vancouver. Lindholm and Zadorov's face on it? Yeah. Depends. So... I'm, I'm going to go, I think after the last two wins, they're feeling pretty good. I think they'll probably play Wolf on Monday and get the win. And I think that, I'm going to say that they play Vladar on Saturday and get the win. So I'm going to go two wins. Okay. Um, who do you think the starting goalies are for the week? Exactly what you said. I think you got to ride the hot hand right now, and that's Wolf. And then with four days off, I think you immediately send them back to the Wranglers. Yeah, provided Markstrom's better by then. Yeah, but even if not, I mean, you don't need to carry two goalies for four days off. Well, the cap matters a lot less now, so... That's true, but I, I let's see. Do the Wranglers play between I don't there? Think so. so I think I think you send them down. Um, let's see. Yeah, because that's, that's... I think you're trying... You want to maximize his starts. 
Um, they do. So they play. So the Flames play the 18th, and then the uh, Wranglers play the 19th and the 20th at home. So I could see them send them back for the game on the 20th. Yeah. And then they also play the 22nd and the Flames on the 23rd. So we'll see. Um. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting how they manage all these all these guys. Well, it's but something to look forward to. It is. At least there'll be a story for us to talk about next week. And Matt, that's exactly what we'll do. We will talk next week and see if the Flames can put up four points this week. As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.